liabilities. Assets, not liabilities. This series has been talking about uh, the importance of understanding not only our value as people, I know that says Jesus up there, yes Lord. But uh, not only talking about our responsibility, our value as people, assets, but also helping us understand that we all have a liability. We all have liabilities. What are liabilities? Think liabilities are things that if we don't address them, leave us vulnerable to attack. Liabilities are things that if we don't address them, leave us vulnerable to attack. Why is this is important? Because we, we've used this business, this business concept of a balance sheet. And in companies that are well run, their balance sheet doesn't show $300 that shows $0. Because a balanced company is a company that knows how to put everything in the right place. You know, following me? And the same way that a company does that is the same way that we should do that with our own life. Is that we should live a life where we know how to put everything in the right place so that our strengths are the things that do really well for us. But our things that are opportunities, our, our liabilities don't overwhelm us and don't impact our impact. <laughs> all right? And so we, we've talked about it all. We talked about debt. PK talked about debt for two sermons. And she, she gave us this wonderful uh, understanding of what does it mean to be in financial debt. Because this is a stewardship series. And she said that debt robs us, robs us of, our, of our ability to partner with God on what our purpose is in life. Debt robs us of our ability to partner with God on what our purpose is in life. When you're in debt, you can't even think clearly. You can't see straight. Not only can you not think clearly, you can't move freely. And sometimes... That burden of debt is not always something that you caused, but it is something that we all have to fix. Yeah. Then we talked about the tithe and tried to reframe our understanding of what is the tithe. Yes, the tithe is 10%, but the blessings that you get from the tithe may not always be financially. Mm -hmm. Because when you read Malachi, it says... Test me and see, won't I open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say financial blessings, it just says blessings. Mm -hmm. Meaning that wherever you need to be blessed, the tie helps let God know that he can trust you with whatever the blessings are. Mm -hmm. It's an important thing for us to understand because if we, if we lean on the principle that God needs our money, then we're missing the importance of God. <clears throat> because now we're, 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 we're making God seem like God is here on earth with us and not that God created the earth. Why do I need your money if I created it? And so we spoke about the tithe very clearly and plainly because the one thing that, the, the thing that happens with the tithe now is that there has been such a, a adverse taste about it that what is happening is that when people start to not clearly understand the tithe, then they handicap the church and doing what the church is supposed to do. Be the resource to those that need help. Feed the hungry. Provide shelter for the homeless. Be a voice to the voiceless. And the only way you can do those things is if you have resources. And we also taught you that God will do the things that you can't do, not the things that you won't do. And the things that we can do is give generously to meet the needs of God's people. And so when a church is not able to meet the needs of the people in the community, stop looking at the church and the pastor first, look at the people in the church. And then ask the question, what are you doing to help the purpose? It's okay. It was quiet last week too. <laughs> And so today, what, what we realize is as we're leaning, lean, as we're getting ready to land this series and head into our next series on Advent, Advent means anticipation. It's the anticipation 
of Christ, the Advent calendar. It's the days leading up to Christmas. Listen, let's go to get out of the way. We know Jesus wasn't born in December. Everybody's good with that? Okay. All right. Well, Jesus wasn't born in December. All right. So, <laughs> I just want to go ahead and put that historical fact there. So, people be like, oh, why did church celebrate Christmas? Okay. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, today we're actually talking about our relationship with God and why it's important that we understand. Right? So we're going to lean into that. 20 minutes. I'm already a little bit over my time. 12.30. Let me hurry up, Courtney. Thank you. All right, family. Here we go. Listen, I grew up in the 90s. Where are my 90s people at? Anybody? Come on. I grew up in the 90s. And while I matriculated into my adult head and my adulthood in the 2000s, the 90s was my time. It was my time. On Saturday morning in the 90s, you better not make any type of noise in the house. But what we did do was get up early every Saturday morning, go in front of the TV, and turn it on to Saturday morning cartoons. Now, if you was like me, in rural South Carolina, where the cable company refused to run the cable lines, <laughs> then you watch cartoons like Looney Tunes, Captain Planet. He's our hero. He's our hero. <laughs> X-Men. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, if you was one of the privileged folk who had cable, and I had it during the summer months only, that's some bootleg thing, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would go to my mom, see y'all. It's a whole nother story, I'll tell y'all later. If you had cable, then you watch some of the other shows. You watch Rugrats, uh -huh. Doug, yes. huh? Come on. Come on. G.I. Joe, my favorite, Thundercats. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> and while you were watching those cartoons, you got a bowl of cereal. Well, because diabetes for kids was a myth in the 90s. And what you ate was Smacks. Captain Crunch. Crunch. Y'all know nothing about this one. This, this, this thing called King Vitamin. What you know about it? King Vitamin, the fake Captain Crunch. Huh? Uh, Lucky Charms. Huh? Not only did we have good cereal, we had good commercials in the 90s. We had commercials that wanted you to be, that inspired you to be great just by watching them. We had commercials that would cause you to repeat things time and time again to your parents until they told you to sit down somewhere. Huh? Who can forget the Budweiser frog? Bud. Bud. Bud wine. Huh? Who can forget the Like Mike Gatorade commercial? Huh? Had us all thinking that we could that we could ball, and if we stuck out our tongue, it would go in the basket. It didn't. <laughs> and those are just a few of the good things that the '90s did. But the one thing that I love about the '90s is that we appreciated the art of writing. In the '90s, you learned how to write in cursive. In the third grade. Huh? Had a TV that showed you how to do it. Tracing those letters. And that curve better be right on that G. The lowercase one. The dotted line. The dotted line. And so I, I loved writing so much that it became my way on how I would uh, talk to the ladies. I did write notes, Dwight. <laughs> and it was a sophisticated note. I call it a three-pronged approach type of note. That had three questions on it. It had, a th it had one question with three responses. Do you like me? 
yes, no, or maybe? <laughs> Do you like me, yes, no, or maybe? In my mind, the yes meant we went together. That's what it meant. The no meant you weren't interested. But the maybe meant I still got a chance. And I would write these notes in class and pass them to the girl who was on the opposite end of the classroom, usually, and wait for her to respond. And then I would pray <laughs> that as the note made its way back to me, nobody that nobody opened the door <laughs> in case it didn't say yes. <laughs> in case it didn't say yes. And so in the sixth grade, I went to a new school. They relined our districts and as they relined our district, I was the new guy on campus. And I saw this girl that I liked. She was in a different classroom. She was tall, nice brown skin, Jerry girl. It was too late in the 90s for her to have a Jerry curl. As a matter of fact, my mom clowned me for it. But I liked what I liked. And so I, 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 I wrote her a note. I gave her the note. Because we weren't in the class, I couldn't get the note to the end of school. Do you like me? But by that time, I had gotten smart and wised up and realized maybe it took too many chances. And so I moved that three-pronged approach to a two-pronged. Do you like me? Yes or no? I need clarity. She said, yes. Hey, we were together. <laughs> Once you checked yes, we started holding hands. She had put her phone number at the top for me. So I started calling her. I bought her a nice Valentine's Day gift from Claire's. <laughs> had to borrow the money, but I got it. <laughs> Then one day after school, I noticed as I waited for her, I saw her coming out from behind the building with somebody else. She had gotten herself into an entanglement. And as I asked her, I was like, what happened? We're supposed to be together. You did check, yes, we together. And she said something that rocked me. She said, I checked, yes, I like you. You assumed that meant that we went together. She said, check, I checked, yes, that I liked you, but you never got clarification of that yes meant that I wanted to be with you. Because it's possible for people to like you but not want to be a part of your life. And so when she when she hit me with that, I was like, now wait a minute. Let, let, let me begin to understand this. And 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 it was a it was a lesson that I needed at an early age because it caused me to grow up. It caused me to get a little bit wiser in my approach. And what I quickly realized was after that. After that situation, I realized that obtaining a yes on paper didn't translate to a genuine commitment to a relationship. Mm -hmm. Obtaining a yes on paper didn't translate to us being in a relationship. I realized I had overlooked the crucial step in my efforts to sidestep the sting of rejection. I had missed the step of synchronizing our thoughts. Because I did not want to feel the sting of rejection, I overstepped, took a shortcut, and didn't not only synchronize our thoughts, I missed the part of synchronization of our actions as well. 
I thought one thing, she meant another. And family, I think that this is important. Because if we're not careful, the way that she did me is the same way that we do God. The way that she did me is the same way that if we're not careful, we do God. We treat salvation as this is the check mark that I like you. And don't bother to have the conversation with God about what does that actually mean. And so we play this game of this, this, this game of trying to escape the responsibility of what it means to be in relationship with God. Because it fits our agenda to like God but not love God. And this is why I believe that the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans says this. He says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you shall be saved. Listen, one writer said it like this, us speaking something audibly lets us know that there's a change coming our way. That sometimes you have to speak things so that you can hear the things so that you can know that you're no longer the thing that was holding you back. Sometimes you have to let yourself know that the change is coming even before the change has completely happened. And so what Paul is saying is, listen, I got to say that I believe even though I feel that I believe. So that when the devil tells me to doubt, I know that I believe. Mm -hmm. Do I need to say that again? I got to say that I believe, mm -hmm. even if I feel that I believe, mm -hmm. so that when the doubt comes in, mm -hmm. I can truly believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is important, because what Paul is doing is he is stretching the Hebrew, the, the Roman people, because he's, he's actually preaching to a mixed congregation at that time. He is stretching them to get them to understand that, that the way in which we were taught, that God is not, is that God is the God, that God is God, but God doesn't want to actually talk with us. God needs other people to talk on, beha on our behalf. He's teaching them that that's not what it really is about. He's teaching us that you got to speak. God is always listening, but sometimes you got to speak. And what you're speaking is not for God, you're speaking for yourself. God already know your thoughts, but sometimes you need to hear your thoughts so that you can know that what you're thinking just might be crazy. Sometimes you got to hear yourself say the crazy thing so that you can know that it's a crazy thing. But likewise, sometimes you got to say the thing that is the affirmation over your life, that is the change-making dream that you've been dreaming. You got to speak that thing out loud so that you can also understand that I can do it. I can do all things. Through Christ Jesus, who strengthens me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whomsoever shall believe in him, shall have everlasting life. I think the beauty of understanding John 3, 16 is it says that for God so loved the world. And the way that one writer says is that we should be in the world, not of the world, which means that God had already, that God sent Jesus down, not because God needed us to do anything. He sent Jesus down to help us. Help us. It's important that we understand this because it helps us rebalance our understanding of why we need a relationship with God because God loved us yet when we were still sinners. He loved us so much that he gave his most precious son, his only son, for people who at a moment's notice will deny him always. If you think, I didn't put it down to white, then I got it. Here's the importance of why you have to understand this. Because the people that Jesus came are the same people that killed Jesus. Oh, wow. 
which means that God already knew I'm going to be hurt by your actions, but I still want you in my presence. It is why we have to understand that we can never love God equally to the way that God loves us. But it doesn't mean that we can't, we can't engage in, a, in love of reciprocity with God. Because reciprocity doesn't mean equal. Reciprocity just means that we're doing something for each other. And scripture gives us a number of ways in which we can have a reciprocal kind of love with God. But I'm going to break it down to you so that you can take it right now in a way that you can understand. And there's a man by the name of Gary Chapman that broke it down for us when we're talking about our human relationships in this thing called the five love languages. And the five love languages is what Gary Chapman says is that every person has need for five love languages, has five love languages. We each prefer one love language, but all five is what help us have a holistic relationship, right? And what I'm here to tell you is that God doesn't just want one love language. God wants all five. Oh, PT, what are you talking about with that? Okay, I got it. Two minutes. All right, we're going to land this thing. Here's the thing of why you have to understand this. iPad acting up. All right, so here are the love languages. Words of affirmation. Quality time. Receiving gifts. Acts of service. And physical touch. Words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, physical touch for God to so love the world. And he gave his one and only son. We can never give God equal love, but we can give God love. But in order for us to give God love, we also have to have an understanding of what is love to God. And love to God is words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. What is that? What am I saying? Words of affirmation, adoration. Words of affirmation to God is adoration is when we speak to God the goodness that God has been in our life time and time of good. I will bless the Lord at all times. For his praises shall continuously be in my mouth. It is when you are letting God know, thank you for the things that you have done that you didn't have to do, even the things that I don't know that you did. Yeah. Words of affirmation are adoration. Okay. God wants quality time. How do we define quality time? Quality time are your spiritual disciplines. Prayer, devotion, Bible study. Prayer, devotion, Bible study, prayer is our intimate communication with God. Devotion is us spending time with God so that God can speak with us through his word. Every relationship requires quality time. And a part of quality time isn't just you speaking, it's also you listening. Which means that in our quality time with God, it's good that you are verbally speaking to God, but how long are you willing to listen for God to speak back? Quality time. Receiving gifts, that's your tithes and your offering, not just your time. That is your tithes and your offering. Tithes and your offering are what allow us to be the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth. They are what allows us to meet the needs of people without making people feel like they have an obligation to be a part of any community when they have a need. Because what I do know about Acts, which is where the church originated, Antioch, the way, right? Is that there was a time that when those who were moved sold all that they had in order to meet the needs of the community. And, and, and this is important for us to understand because what it doesn't say is that the, they met the needs of those who were in their church. It says that they met the needs of those who are in the community. Which means that the gifts in the hearts of those who received Christ gave grace to those who may have been oblivious that they needed Christ so that they could understand the goodness of God in their time of need. And my question for you is, are you willing to allow those that may not know that they need Christ to experience the goodness of Christ through the grace of your gift giving so that when they have a need, they can see God in front of them and God looks like God's creations on two feet. 
We are supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We are supposed to be those that change the world. We're supposed to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. We are supposed to be the ones that are consistent, not only in our words, but our deeds. But the only way for you to do that is for you to do more than check a box. You got to get clarity and understand what it really means. So words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service. That is the care for others. Scripture says the greatest commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. Another scripture says, how can you say that you love God but hate your neighbor who is right in front of you? For if you hate any person, then you cannot truly love God because God is love. Not only is God love, Scripture reminds us that we are the Imago Dei, those created in the image of God. So when we show hatred towards anyone else, we are telling God that I hate you. And how can you be in a loving relationship with anyone that you say you hate? This is why you got to do more than just check a box. You got to understand what it means to say yes. And finally, physical touch. Now, how can we touch God, PT? We're doing it today. Because my Bible tells me that the church is the body of Christ. That every part of the body is important. Which means that when you come to worship and you're engaging and touching other people, you're touching parts of God. This is why you can never lean in and believe what people are saying that says the church is irrelevant. Because the moment that you say that, you're saying that God is irrelevant. If the church wasn't important, then explain why Jesus put a group of people together to form the early church. If the church wasn't important, then explain to me, why did he send the disciples out to all nations, professing the good news? If the church wasn't important, tell me why did the Roman Empire persecute them historically throughout time? If the church wasn't important, why do we have letters of, of, of written by a man by Pliny the Younger who says, I don't know who these people are. But what I do know is that they are a thorn in our side because they're getting them, they're getting the people, the masses, to think about life in a different way. If the church is not important, then why are you here? Because the purpose of the church was never for judgment. It was always for trust and accountability. The whole point of the church is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever shall believe in him shall have everlasting life. Do you want to believe? And do you want everlasting life? Let's stand on our feet. do a couple of things. We're going to tie everything together because I want to honor your time. So for some of you, you need a relationship with God. You have a desire for a relationship with God. We want you to check the box. But then when we call you, we're going to ask you to clarify what does that mean. I'm going to walk you through what does it mean to be in relationship with Christ? We're not going to abandon you. We're not going to say, hey, you said yes. We're going to help you understand the weight that comes with that yes. For some of you, you need a church home. You've been here in Nashville by yourself. You've been trying to figure out from time to time. Like, you're like, I love a church, but uh, I don't really want no accountability. Or I haven't really had anyone who like touches me in a certain way. We would love for that to be here. I'm not going to lie. We want growth. We want to fill these seats. Why? 
because every empty seat is a soul that is missing out. It ain't about the seat, it's about the people that's missing from the seats. And so we should think about that every single time. Who do I want to fill this spot so that God can speak to them in this place? For some of you, you're trying to figure out like, where is where where do I need to tighten it up? We're gonna pray for you for that. Now we're gonna pray for a benediction. That as you leave this place, that God speaks to you, that God speaks over your life. And that you not only survive, but that you thrive because of this relationship. You good? Jesse, you can throw my giving graphic. Listen, we'd love for you to partner with us financially. It helps us do the good work here. It's how we help feed the students in this building. We do it in real time. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you because you're a good God. We thank you that we didn't deserve the sacrifice that Christ gave us, but you gave it anyway. We thank you for the pain that we caused. We thank you that you're a good, that you're so good. That even when we hurt you, when we cut you with our words, that you still welcome us back with open arms. And so we pray peace over everyone's mind in this place. We pray blessings over everyone's finances in this place. We thank you for reconciling us back to you. And may we do more than just check a box, yes. May our actions align with your word. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day.